be fun uh, for me to see not only uh, some of my former students, but uh, distinguished alums that I've been meeting over the years, and uh, some of my colleagues as well. Um, so welcome this evening. We're really delighted that you were able to um, come. We know this is a busy time of year with uh, everything from uh, Labor Day, uh, people being on vacation, kids going back to school, and so forth. So thank you for making the time to come back to your law school. It's my pleasure to introduce Dean Levy. Now, we could say that he's a man who needs no introduction, which I believe is true, but he's going to get one anyhow, whether he wants one or not. But I will compromise by making it a short introduction. I know everybody who has made the time to come here tonight um, really feels a connection to the law school and I'm sure has read about our new dean and knows something about his background. But I want to speak to you just very briefly about it from a personal perspective, because I think that maybe doesn't come through as much in the materials that we uh, print up. So I want to tell you that I would like to claim credit for being a scout, uh, a kind of undercover agent uh, who was out in the, in the legal world uh, looking. I didn't know I was looking because I didn't know that Kate Bartlett was going to resign. But as I look back on it, I was looking for dean candidates. And as I look back on it, I was extraordinarily lucky to be at the right place in the right time to meet then Judge Levy. And I was incredibly impressed with Judge Levy when uh, he and I worked together, or I worked for him, I guess I should say, as the newest reporter on one of the uh, rules committees that uh, presented their work to the standing committee um, on the rules of practice and procedure. And if you think back to civil procedure, you will remember the Rules Enabling Act. <laughs> yes, they will, because they're Duke lawyers. And if you think back, and you'll remember there's a process for promulgating these rules, and it requires a great deal of effort by a very skilled and dedicated and hardworking group of practicing lawyers and judges. And the umbrella group above all of that that really is coordinating it is run by the Standing Committee on Practice and Procedure, which is always chaired by one of the most distinguished judges in the country. You can see where this story is going. Because the chair at that time was uh, Judge David Levy. And I was privileged to see him orchestrate matters. And I saw the things that, in retrospect, I knew when I became a member of the search committee I was looking for in a dean. I saw a person of great wisdom a person of phenomenally good judgment, a person who was a good leader and was an excellent, uh, had excellent interpersonal skills and could work with a group productively, a group with big egos. Um, it wasn't a law school faculty, but those Article Three life tenure judges, they think they're pretty smart. And the big deal practicing lawyers who are appointed on these committees uh, have uh, their own sense of self-importance. So I saw someone who had the judgment, the intellect that was respected by everybody in the room, who was able to move things forward in a way that was really impressive and was really in the public interest. And then I learned that he had the heart of a scholar, that he had been working for years on a degree in legal history, that he was always interested in more than just the bottom line, but the kind of... Um, policies behind things and the sort of larger academic picture. And I thought, hmm, maybe we have our man. Uh, and uh, we were lucky enough to uh, convince him to begin talking with us about Duke Law School. And uh, we've been lucky ever since that he continued talking with us and that we were able to attract him to our campus. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce to you tonight David Levy. Thank you, Sarah. That's, that was very lovely. It's great to be here. Um, many of you have asked me, how am I doing? And I'm doing just great. It's, it's been so much fun for Nancy and for me uh, to move to, to Durham. And it feels so much, we feel so much at home here already. The students are wonderful. The faculty and staff uh, are just exceptional. And what I've come to learn is that the alumni love their law school. And that's, that's really wonderful. The law school is in terrific shape. And 
I thank Kate Bartlett for that. Um, she's been lovely to me, just truly wonderful to me. But I've come to learn in talking to many of the alumni that I have other deans to thank as well. And many, many names come up. Um, I've heard a great deal about Dean Laddie because I understand that he, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Apparently he drove around the country scouring the countryside for people who look confused. And, uh, <laughs> And he found a few of you, and you turned out all right. <laughs> so uh, people have said, what are the surprises? You know, what has surprised you most about North Carolina? And I will tell you that one of the great joys of living in Sacramento is that there are no insects at night. And so I thought coming to North Carolina, I was surprised to find that there were no insects at night. But then I found that I was scratching a great deal. And so I am surprised by your mosquitoes. Uh, they are small and they are vicious. Uh, now the law school is also small, but we would say not vicious, but I think we would say small and quite exceptional. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed about North Carolinians is that while they are very nice people, and all of you have been very kind to me, uh, when you get them on the road, they like to tailgate a great deal. I don't know if any of you have seen that phenomenon, and I'm not quite certain what it means, but <laughs> it does mean that I do feel pushed along a great deal, and uh, that may be a very good thing. Now, uh, what about becoming, leaving the judiciary and becoming a dean. What, what is that like? And I, I do get a lot of questions about that. And uh, I could give a very long answer to that. There's quite a bit to say, but I'm fascinated by the language of the university. If you read my talk to the entering class, I spent a good deal of time uh, gently ribbing my new colleagues about some of the jar academic jargon that is here. And I'll give you two examples of it. So. People in a, in a law school, particularly those who are interested in business, they're constantly talking about scaling. Does it scale? Uh, can you scale it? They're not talking about fish or climbing walls or anything like that, uh, but they're talking about size and whether things work on, on a bigger size. And I thought, why as a judge have I never heard the term, can you scale it? And um, the thought occurred to me that um, in, a in, in a litigation context, in a, in, a, in a courthouse, you don't worry about whether things scale or not. You worry about the people in front of you in the particular case, and you don't view each case as a prototype for something else. So that's, that's different. They also talk a great deal here at Duke about convening power. I'm sure you've heard that term, that Duke has convening power. Now, when I was a judge, I never worried about whether I had convening power. I just said, you know, we'll be here tomorrow, and if you're not, uh, there's a very nice gentleman there who will be happy to put you in the lockup. <laughs> now that's convening power. Um, so I'm not surprised by the uh, loyalty of the alumni of this great law school. And um, I will say this about Law I think this is true of law school, the great law schools in general. It's certainly true of what I have come to learn about Duke. We have a unique relationship with our alumni. We, we need you. Uh, you need us. You're very interested in our students, and you recruit them. Uh, many of you do. Uh, we're very interested in what you do because we are scholars of the law, and we want to know what's going on in law practice. And we have an educational relationship that continues uh, from cradle to grave. And that's really quite unique. I don't think the history department at Duke University, not to pick on history, but I have some background in history, I don't think it reaches out to its graduates and says, what's going on in history? We need to know. Would you please tell us? And by the same token, I don't think that historians who graduated from Duke are eager to come back to Duke to talk to their professors and to talk to students and to recruit them. They don't have that kind of relationship. And it's quite unique. And it's very strong. My theme is unity. So um, it is extraordinary to have been a judge and then to come to a legal academy of this caliber. But underneath it all, we are all lawyers. We are all in, in one profession. And I think if the appointment uh, by Dick Broadhead has any symbolism, it is to remind us all that it is one profession, that. Uh, Lawyers care greatly about ideas. They care about the future of the profession, the training of our students. And by the same token, law professors care greatly about the future of the profession and what it is that you do. They like to study it. And they like to know about it. And together, 
faculty and staff, students and alumni, we together in unity can build a great law school. And this law school is, I think, on the cusp of some very exciting developments. So unity, unity, uh, the unity between teaching and scholarship, the unity between law and other disciplines, uh, the unity of our vision, which is international and national, but as we emphasize tonight, also intensely local. We're interested in North Carolina. We don't turn our back on where we are. We're, we're very committed to this, this state and to this region. The unity of theory and practice and the unity of service, public service, and of education. And a big part of our education here, of course, is experiential and practical. And tonight we are celebrating the clinics at Duke Law School. Some of you have asked whether there will be a bow tie clinic, and I'm happy to report <laughs> there will be. Um, uh, we'll have to do it over at the Wash Duke in the bar uh, some night, and I pledge to you that I will be there and I will do the best that I can. Service to community and to professional education is, is certainly not something to, to joke about. Uh, we have a tradition of public service. We have a tradition at this law school of staying close to the profession. And the clinics are an extremely important expression of that tradition and one that we intend to, to build on. It's a very important piece of the education here. Uh, we have a wonderful group of clinics, and I am going to turn the program over now to the director of our clinics, uh, Andrew Foster, who has his JD from another school in this local area where he did rather well. Um, he is a clinical professor of law. He is the director of the Community Enterprise Clinic, and he oversees all of our clinics. He's a marvelously creative person and um, is totally committed to our students and to this community, and Professor Foster. Uh, thank you, Dean Levy. It's, uh, that is a far too kind introduction, and as uh, so many people that I practice with at Womble Carlisle know, only a very slight bit of that is true, but I'm, uh, the one part that is unquestionably true is how committed I am uh, to our clinical program, and, and really just delighted to have the opportunity to share with you, um, along with uh, a great group of panelists, um, all the exciting things that, that we're doing in clinical legal education at Duke right now. Um, just to make sure that we're all on the same page, I wanted to start by making sure that everyone knows um, how we think uh, of clinics or what a clinic is at Duke. Um, a clinic at Duke is an advanced course where students get credit for representing clients, real clients, both individuals and organizations who would otherwise not have access to legal services under the close supervision of law school faculty. Um, there are different models for clinics at other places, but that's how we do it, and we're really excited about the group of clinics and the uh, group of clinicians that we have, um, and really, really excited about all the students and interest in our clinics um, here at the law school. Um, clinics, I think, play a really important part of the overall curriculum at the law school. Um, not only do they give students the opportunity to develop and practice and refine their legal skills, but within the different substantive areas that our clinics work, um, they give students the opportunity to really deeply understand the, the law and how it plays in practice and on the street and in the real world. And most importantly, because students are directly representing their own clients, it gives them the chance to work on very difficult, challenging real world problems, and in the best of all worlds, to help those, their clients solve those problems for themselves. Um, so it's a really exciting, um, it's an exciting thing to be part of this work at Duke. Um, and there's a lot of elements that go into making a successful um, law clinic program, to making a clinic program uh, a part of a great law school. Um, and we're working hard on, on bringing all those elements together. But the one thing that you just can't replace are the people, right? Um, you've got to have extremely smart, motivated students, and we have that here, and you're going to hear from two of, two of our students about their experiences. You've got to have good clients and good cases that give those students the kinds of rich opportunities that they can really sink their teeth into and learn from. Um, and you've also got to have really passionate, caring, dedicated faculty that um, not only are dedicated to, to teaching 
um, but also are really committed to the service aspect of the work of clinics. And so while I've got the floor, I want to just take this opportunity to ask those folks who are with me on the clinical faculty um, who aren't going to get a chance like Jim to speak to you in just a second to stand up uh, so that I can introduce them to you really, uh, really briefly. Um, to start back over here, uh, Professor Reich Longest is the director of our uh, newest clinic, the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic. Um, behind him is Professor Alan Weinberg, who's the director of the Low Income Taxpayer Clinic. Um, probably many, many of you know Teresa New Professor Teresa Newman, who teaches with Jim Coleman in the Wrongful Convictions Clinic. Um, Professor Jane Weddick is the director of the Children's Clinic. Next to Jane is Professor Allison Rice, who teaches in the AIDS Clinic. And then in the back is Professor Brenda Berlin, who teaches with Jane in uh, the Children's Clinic. So thank you all very much for coming. Um, I could go on and on about all the things that are exciting and, and, and everything that's going on in our clinics, but I just really want to highlight uh, three things before I turn this over to Jim and let him tell you from his perspective as a clinical teacher, um, what he's doing in the clinics and how, how that fits into our overall education program at Duke. Um, the first is that I've now been here, this is my sixth year of teaching at Duke, and I am just overwhelmed by uh, the support that the clinics have from this institution, um, and particularly want to recognize the leadership that Dean Bartlett um, provided over her seven years of, of building our clinical program and um, I'm just so excited about the opportunity to work with David to continue and, and capture that momentum, because uh, I think we're really headed in a, in a, in a terrific direction. Um, second thing, this is sort of uh, uh, self-indulgent, I suppose, but if you haven't been down to the second floor yet to see the clinical suite, I really would encourage you and invite you to come down there. Um, I don't know how we swung it, but we have by far the best space in the law school. Um, the students have by far, by far the best space in the law school, but that really represents, the opening of that clinical suite two years ago really, for me, represents the significant commitment of this institution to this kind of work. And uh, it's been wonderful for all of us to be here, to be in the same place, and to have this phenomenal modern law office that um, probably compares pretty favorably to the RTP office of Womble Carlisle and made my transition a lot easier from practice. Um, and then the last thing I would say, um, and, and I know that um, Michael Palmer, the, the director of community affairs at Duke, is going to, I hope, touch on this theme. But it's really remarkable on a daily basis not only to get to teach and not only to be inspired by our students and to be part of, of helping our clients do all the great things that they do, but to really recognize the impact that we have on, on Durham, on this region, and, and across the state. Um, and I think people will tell you a little bit about what they're doing. And this isn't probably the best way to measure this, but just to give you some hard numbers, um, over 100 students every year take our clinical courses. If you combine the hours that they spend working for clients with the hours that the faculty spend, you're talking about somewhere between 15 and 20,000 hours of pro bono legal assistance that we provide in the state. And um, Don Beskind, who many of you know, will chastise me for using this number because he thinks it's way too low. But if you, if you give the cost factor of a dollar per hour um, for that, for the value of those services, which is pretty low compared to even what summer associates are making at, um, at the kind of firms that our students are at, um, you're talking about well over a million dollars a year of free legal services that this law school is providing. Um, now, that doesn't capture the impact that we have on people's lives, uh, the transformative effect that, that, you know, Jane's Clinic and the students that work there have when they help a child through the school system or the work that um, Jim's students can have uh, investigating the claims of someone who's been in prison wrongfully convicted, but it does give you sort of a snapshot of the real impact that we have in a quantitative way. So um, I hope that makes you proud. It certainly makes all of us proud. And I'm really, really delighted again to have the opportunity to share with you a little bit about what we do. So let me turn it over to Jim Coleman. Well, uh, hello, it's good to see all of you, uh, including some former students. Um, I, I was told I have three minutes uh, <laughs> to talk about uh, wrongful convictions. That's, that's not nearly enough time. Uh, but let me just say, uh, you know, we, we, we're part of, and, and I would say at the center of, a, a, an effort here in North Carolina to reform the criminal justice system. 
Uh, and I think Duke has been central to that. Um, and, and the proof of that is that, uh, you know, Teresa is president of a, a, in a, a network of Innocence Project National. Uh, uh, she and I are, uh, we're on the Chief Justice's Innocence Commission that then set up the North Carolina uh, Innocence Inquiry Commission, the only one in the country, uh, that a, a, an official state agency that uh, is, um, that was set up in order to investigate claims of actual innocence uh, and to, uh, to bring about the release of innocent people uh, in prison. The, uh, the very first director uh, of, the, uh, of the commission uh, is Kendra uh, Montgomery Blend. Why don't you stand up so that they see who you are? Uh, <coughs> because she is also, this is Kendra, she, uh, she is, she's also a product of uh, the Innocence Project, which is what <laughs> basically all we were when, when Kendra was here. Uh, the, the, uh, we're going to evolve, evolve into a wrongful convictions clinic. Uh, and I hope that next year that's what we'll be officially. Right now, we're still a wrongful convictions course that investigates uh, cases on behalf of inmates who claim to be innocent. Uh, but we're much more than that. Uh, you know, we, we, we are producing students who, uh, who learn how to investigate facts, uh, who learn how the criminal justice system works, uh, who learn how to work together uh, to uh, pursue a goal. Uh, and when they graduate, uh, although we can't require this, uh, we tell them that we expect that they will uh, be involved in, uh, in efforts in their communities, wherever they are, uh, to try to improve the criminal justice system and uh, particularly uh, to do what they can to uh, uh, to obtain the freedom of innocent people who are in prison. We've made a lot of mistakes in the criminal justice system. A lot of innocent people are in prison. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, I think it's something that uh, our students are proud that they're involved in an effort to try to identify them uh, and to free them. Uh, we decided uh, that we were going to do the difficult cases, uh, not just the DNA cases. That's low-hanging fruit. Uh, you know, Barry Sheck and those guys up in New York, they get a lot of credit for having released 200 people using DNA, but how many have they released where they reinvestigate the case without DNA? That's what we're trying to do. Uh, we haven't released anybody yet, but uh, <laughs> that just shows how difficult it is. Uh, there, there is, we're very close. Teresa and I today, you know, uh, spent the morning uh, in Winston-Salem trying to negotiate the release of a person uh, who's, uh, who we believe is innocent, uh, and I think uh, uh, we are making an impression on the DA uh, that uh, he is innocent. Uh, and then we had to run back to uh, Durham to uh, teach wrongful convictions. Uh, and then after that, I came down here to talk about this. Uh, but this really is a family uh, effort. Uh, it's not just, you know, Teresa, and, uh, and it's not just me, uh, but, you know, it's the students. It's our alumni. We have uh, Walter Bazetta, who uh, practices law in D.C., uh, who was the, uh, I guess he was a teaching assistant for wrongful conviction when he was here. He's at a D.C. law firm now, and uh, he is going to, his law firm is representing a case that Kendra uh, investigated when she was here, a person who was convicted in 1976 of murder. I, and we believe he is innocent, and we're going to file a motion for appropriate relief uh, sometime in the next uh, month or so, uh, and he will be represented by Walter Bazetta. So uh, it, it really is a, it's a network, uh, a Duke network, uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're not just trying to, uh, you know, the students are learning about the causes of wrongful conviction and the, and the remedies, but also they're actually getting the experience of uh, trying to gain the freedom of people who, who are innocent, who've been wrongfully convicted. So it's, uh, it's really exciting. And uh, you know, if we can get Teresa out of the dean's office <laughs> so, that <she> can <laughs> so that she can spend more time on this, uh, it's going to be extraordinary. Thanks for coming, though. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Chris Lott. I'm a third year law student here at Duke. Um, I am what Professor Bill used to call in criminal law a recidivist in the clinics. Um, last spring 2007, I was in the Children's Education Law Clinic with Professor Weddick and um, 
Professor Berlin, and this semester I'm working with uh, Professor Weinberg in the low-income taxpayer clinic. So I have, I'm just kind of getting into that clinic right now, but I think I kind of have a, a relatively broad perspective and really believe that the clinic's been a wonderful addition to my legal education here. Um, what Dean Levy hit on in his introduction is a lot of the reason why I came to Duke. There's a strong commitment to public service here, and I believe strongly that the clinics have been the primary vehicle for me be, to be able to kind of carry that out, and I've really, really enjoyed that. But the clinics have given me much more as well, and I figured maybe a little bit of a story would about one of my experiences would kind of illustrate some of the, the lessons I learned while in the clinic uh, last year, and hopefully will continue to learn this year. And in about March of 2007, um, I had an individualized education plan meeting, which is basically where we're trying to secure services, appropriate educational services for our client. And she was a special education student, and we felt she hadn't been done rightly by the school up to that point. So we met with the principal, with the school teachers, and with the school attorney in an effort, in a collaborative effort, to try to secure the appropriate educational services. Now beforehand, I had prepared what I thought to be an excellent opening statement. Um, thought that, you know, I was going to lay out for them clearly what we expected. I was going to lay out for them what we hoped them they would do for us and what they wouldn't do again in the future. And about 10 minutes in, I interjected and, and gave this, this little introduction and the entire meeting, well not the entire meeting, but for the next 20 minutes the meeting went completely downhill. It went, it, the collaborative sort of culture that started out changed into a far more adversarial culture and that just wasn't going to get it done with eight or nine people in the room that had to agree. Um, so the meeting ended up okay. We worked out with the school attorney certain things, but then I had a 45-minute ride, ride home with Jane that night, and uh, we talked a little bit about what went right and what went wrong. We both, both definitely put our finger on that introduction as kind of a, something that could have been different. And um, she put it very diplomatically, and I, I agreed. I, we both kind of saw the meeting go change a little bit from there. I uh, went home that night a little insecure about myself, but kind of reflected on it, and oddly enough, came to the conclusion that, you know, this is kind of why I came to law school. Um, and I came to law school because I wanted to learn the practice of law. Um, I feel like a lot of times we get into... We're, we're up in the clouds in law school, and I, I like it, and it's intellectual. It's, you learn analysis, you, you learn the law, but you don't really learn what it's like down on the ground. So I think it brings you down from the clouds. It gets you to see what it means to actually deal in a situation like that. I knew the law going into that meeting. I knew the expectations that I set out were consistent with the law, but that necessarily wasn't necessarily the way to do it, and I learned a lot of lessons from that. I think I also learned from that meeting and from other places um, a lot about communication. That day, maybe if my tone was different or, or my, the wording choices I used were different or the way I communicated them to the whole group, if those would have been different, I think that it could have had a different impact as well. And I took that experience throughout that clinic and hopefully into this year and beyond and really tried to, to grasp onto always understanding the audience, always understanding the people that I talk to, and knowing full well that communication is a large part of what we do as lawyers, so, or hopefully to be lawyers like me. And finally, just realizing the real impact that we had. Um, that meeting didn't go as well as we wanted to, but we ended up securing the, the services for that student and helping a number of other people along, and that was the greatest part of being in the clinic, is getting into people's lives, helping them, and feeling like what you were learning in the classroom really had some sort of impact and was changing people's lives. So I really feel, feel like it's rounded out my education here, and I'm a strong supporter of them. So. Hi, uh, my name is Kate Garrett. Um, I'm a 4L here at the law school. I'm also getting my master's in environmental management at the Nicholas School down the street. 
Um, I hope that at the end of my clinic experience that I have as great experience as this Chris did, I'm in my second week at the uh, Environmental Law and Policy Clinic um, with Professor Longest. So it's a brand new clinic. And um, I was really excited that at the beginning of the summer, I was working at a law firm out in Los Angeles when I got the email that this clinic was um, going to get up and running this fall and that there was a spot spot for me in it if I wanted to. And um, it was just a great opportunity um, to really put what I've learned in the classroom to use. Uh, I realized quickly starting at a law firm this summer that uh, practical experience is probably not at the top of the list of things you learn your first year in law school. And um, I just really was excited to have an opportunity to get that kind of experience in a learning environment. And um, so far, so good. Uh, it's been two weeks. Um, I've done my first client interview, which was a great experience. And just getting that client interaction um, that you don't get um, in the usual classroom setting has been really valuable. Um, and the facilities are wonderful, like everyone's been saying. And uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> OK. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Michael Palmer, and I'm Assistant Vice President and, uh, in the Office of Community Affairs, and we uh, administer a program called the Neighborhood Partnership. Uh, the Neighborhood Partnership is in its 10th year. It's an empowerment strategy where we work with the 12 neighborhoods around the two campuses on quality of life issues. And you ask maybe why is that important? Um, for three reasons. Uh, that there's a collection of things heard and thought about over time in my mind, but and one is the concept of an enlightened self-interest. And um, if you look at, and I do have a rusty CPA license so I can make some business analogies from time to time, but if you look at the college or university as a business, what is the lifeline of the business? It's the ability to attract students and faculty, such that if the community around you suffer, is suffering, then you go, you're going to go with it. Unlike a private sector business, you can't pick up and relocate and that sort of thing. So. You've seen a movement over the last 10 years or so where colleges and universities have gotten more involved in, in, their, uh, in their communities. And in one aspect of it is this concept of an enlightened self-interest. Uh, second reason for it, is, as I would see it, is if we are developing the leaders of tomorrow, then in my judgment, leadership is the ability to cause someone to choose to give their best effort to an objective you can inspire them to believe in. Meaning, if you're going to be a true leader, you have to understand people extremely well. And we're living in a, in, in a more and more diverse world every day. Diverse is more than, than ethnic, it's interest, it's all these other kind of things. So if you don't, so it's important for students to get out and experience real people on the ground, understanding what motivates and et cetera, such that they will be better trained to, to, uh, to deal with issues in the future. And then I think, uh, if I put another hat on, I, I served in local government here in Durham for uh, 12 years prior, prior to coming to Duke University eight years ago. So I was deputy county manager, experienced some time as an interim county manager. So I think I understand the dynamics of the, of the politics and, and how this community works um, reasonably well. And then I superimpose that local experience you know, onto the national scale. But I think our, 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 our most Difficult issues for our country, our civilization, etc., are embedded in the issues of poverty. And I think that we really, you know, in order to raise the level of our society, we have to address those issues. So for all those reasons, I think universities being engaged in, in, in communities is extremely, extremely important. Um, we, the strategy that we use in the Neighborhood Partnership Program and Office of Community Affairs and working with these 12 neighborhoods is an empowerment strategy where we, we don't go into the community saying we, we know your problem and here's the solution and we want to you know, kind of force feed it to you. We take the approach of listening to the community, let them articul articulate the issue or the challenge, then we figure out how we can help, what resources we can bring to bear on, on, on their issues. Um, all that said, uh, I would say in, in over the last eight years that I've been there, we've developed what we refer to as internal partners, organizations inside the university that assist us in delivering services to the community. Uh, it's one thing to have the right organization or the right academic unit supporting us. It's another thing to have the right 
you know, the right head and heart supporting us. So with that, um, it's been a blessing to us that we've had Andrew Foster and the, and the Community Academic um, Development Law Clinic supporting our work. Um, you know, I've presented before and talked about lessons I've learned, and I've learned, I've, I have been further educated stepping outside of government and working at grassroots level in community. I thought I knew some things before, you know, because I was involved in the, stru in, 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 the, in the structure of government. I've learned substantially more in, in this, this experience I've had in the neighborhood partnership. Uh, and I would just touch on, I've got 10 steps to community development that I've kind of, you know, developed as my own uh, lessons learned, but I'll hit on a couple of them and tell you how it connects with the, with the law clinic. Well, one, the, my first uh, uh, thing that I recognize they have to do is import, incredible, uh, import credible expertise. You may have an inside in an organization, but if you don't have it, you go get it. And I think that, you know, Andrew and other folks that, that represent the law clinic, they bring that. You know, these practitioners that, that understand the issues that we're addressing uh, and understand, you know, the, the nuances of, of, of community development. So I think that in the clinic we, we've established that, we have that. Uh, one of the things that, that we have to do before we can get anything done in the community, because actually in the community things, community pays controls. You may go in thinking that you're going to get something done and sometime certain, you know, we're going to do this in a year or, or you try to tie it to budget years and all that kind of stuff. Community pays, it doesn't work that way. Uh, what's critically important in a community is you build relationships of trust, meaning you're, you deliver on what you promise, etc. And I would say that the law clinic has assisted us tremendously in that context with the projects that we've worked on and things that they, they have, have brought to the table and assisting our uh, grassroots partners in the neighborhoods that we work with. So again, uh, they've helped us build trust and develop strong working relationships to the extent that there is, is definitely, the, and that trust is reciprocal. You know, they know what we're capable of delivering and, and, and uh, we know what, what, what they would follow through on. Uh, another aspect of community development to get started, and when I was in local government, I used to think that things like, well, you look at a, a depressed neighborhood, uh, certain things you want to do, one of the things you might want to do is, is to bring some commercial interest involved, you know, to create jobs, etc. Well, you know, that's not the... Um, that's not how it gets started. One of the things you have to do in community development, particularly in neighborhoods, is you have to really uh, find the spirit of the community. And in that sense, what you must do is find that catalyst project that taps the pride of the community. Uh, in one of the neighborhoods we work in, in uh, Lion Park, that project was the Lion Park uh, uh, Community Center, which was a run-down school, it was a surplus school, it was vacant, uh, there was, um, the city put six million dollars into it, there was a lot of political challenge to that project, and, 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 the, and the newspaper actually beat it to death in terms of uh, calling it a boondoggle and all types of things like that. But if you understood the community and the people in it, that project, that school and its history and what it, what it represented to that community, what was, uh, what was important. And to me, my thinking about that is what statement do you make to a community when you allow a public facility in the minds of the community to deteriorate in their midst? The statement is we don't care. So that project was critically important to get that thing moving. Um, you had a grassroots organization seeking to uh, take on the leadership to get that project going. One thing I would say about grassroots organizations and people in communities is don't qu they know what they want. You know, there's no question. They know the what. The challenge is the how. How do we get it done? How do we maneuver through certain, certain processes, systems, procedures, etc., to accomplish what they need? So the un infrastructure aspect of things is what, where, where people stumble. And that's where we've had, uh, again, I can't, cannot give enough accolades to the Community Economic Law Clinic in terms of, and Andrew's people in terms of what they've brought to the table in terms of helping community organizations
develop the infrastructure to get things done. You know, I could tell a lot of war stories, but I would tell you that project and where it is now and where it's going in the future and it is, now, is now deemed a success. It's now deemed a huge success and, and folks want to take credit for it. But I would tell you behind the scenes, behind the curtain, working out operating agreements with the city and the complex structure that our organization has, you know, the, a lot of the work, we wouldn't be where we are and I, I would say that there's some infrastructure things that would, that would crumble without the work of the law clinic and, and the students the students there. Um, let's see, the, uh, and again, I could easily go past three minutes because there's so many soapbox issues <laughs> that, that, that I could get on, but one last thing I would say is that um, one of the things in working with communities, again, they, they, they're, they're passionate and, and they understand the what, but you know, understanding how to move forward is always a challenge. So, you know, in the neighborhoods that we've worked in, and one in particular, in six neighborhoods that we work with, and, and they've bonded together, developed a strategic plan together uh, called the Quality of Life. And they've developed their own plan, their own areas of focus, you know, economic development, housing, and, and a number of different areas. And we have a very sophisticated land banking uh, project going on there that I think is unique in the country, where we have three providers, self-help, land trust, and, and, um, and Habitat for Humanity all working together. And they have their own turfs in, in terms of how they do their affordable housing. But they're all bonded around working with the community via memorandums of understanding written by the law clinic, again. So, so it, it's something that, that there's no other entity like this that exists because technically they are not an entity. They're, they're just formal organizations following the lead of the community via memorandums of understanding. To date, they have uh, constructed, uh, I would say, about 30 or so affordable housing properties with 50 properties in a land bank to be later developed distributed and later developed. Again, a very unique and sophisticated structure that, that could not have been accomplished without the support uh, of the clinic. And um, the last point I want to make is when you take, when you try to facilitate this kind of work with communities, uh, the, the term that I've coined is, is education forward. You can take a lot of heat out of, out of conflicting agendas if you teach folks about the systems or, or, the, or the, the world they're about to get into. Because affordable housing is really about competing against market forces. You know, incomes do not rise as fast as costs. And it's only fair to pay contractors for, for a good day's work, so to speak. So somewhere in there you have to build in a subsidy. So, you know, you can't always get exactly what you want in terms of an individual's thinking. So, and so one way you, you take some of the heat out of this agenda conflict is to educate folks about the world that they're entering into. Uh, and the law clinic has been extremely helpful in working with us to provide that type of training to get folks understanding you know, the work that they're doing. Uh, again, so again, there are quite a number of soapbox issues I could jump on in support of, 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 <coughs> of the clinic. But I will tell you that it's, uh, for the Neighborhood Partnership Program and the work we do in community affairs, an invaluable partner, and I'd say the value is, is much greater than the numbers that you've expressed. Thank you, Michael, mm -hmm. and thank you to all of you. I hope that this has given you at least a, a brief snapshot of what we do. Um, you got the chance to at least hear the names and see the faces of the clinical faculty. We'd really encourage you, if you have questions or want to learn more about what we do, give any of us a call. Um, we're here over the winter break, we're here over the summer, we're here late at night. Um, you, you'll track us down if you want to find us. Um, I know that if it wasn't for the free food and drink, it was to get the chance to uh, ask the dean some questions um, that brought you here, and so I don't want to stand in the way of that too much longer, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to say, as we build our clinical program, um, it's something that we need to do internally, but it's really going to take your help, right? I mean, there, there are resources that we need to build and sustain that. Um, I'm sure you're not surprised to be hit up for money. Um, and, uh, and I have the pleasure to do that. Um, and you're going to hear about this. But I think one of our goals 
as we move forward is to build an endowment to support the clinics. It's something that has to be done. We cannot, we cannot continue to do this work at the high level um, that we do it with the impact that we have funded solely by grants. And that's something that collectively we're going to have to try to figure out if we want to make this some, the, the clinical program um, sustained and, and as integral a part of this law school as I think the vision that the dean has laid out um, for you. Um, the other thing, though, is that we need your, your help, your time, and your talent. Um, there are opportunities to serve on our advisory boards. If you have cases that you think would be good cases for the clinics, please give any, any of the clinical faculty a call and refer those cases. If you or your firms are looking to do pro bono work, we usually have more clients than we can handle, and we'd love to be able to refer those to you. So um, there are lots of ways that you can help us. I know a lot of you in the audience are already doing that. Um, and uh, I'd love to single a bunch of you out, but um, I really don't want to keep you all from, from your opportunity to continue your conversation with Dean Levy. So thank you very much for your attention. We really appreciate it. Well, we don't want to have to call on you, so. <laughs> you can ask me a question, or you can ask any of our panelists a question, and uh, somebody should ask a question. There's one. Hi, I'm Dylan Dellinger, and um, I've loved the opportunity to hear the panelists speak. And the first thing I noticed is that Duke Law School is an extraordinarily different place than it was when, um, when I came here. We had the Children's Law Clinic, which was great, but to see all these clinics is just wonderful. I wonder if you have anything in your mind, and I know you haven't been here that long, that are long-term goals. What would you like to see uh, change about the law school, or do you have any special projects that you see that you would like to take place over the next five or 10 years? So you're talking beyond the clinics, though, in yeah, the, in the, the question. Yeah, and ways that you think that the law school can improve or become different while you're here. Right. Uh, the, the law school is operating at an extremely high level, and so one of the one of the main goals is not to screw it up. <laughs> uh, and there's there's certain things that we simply have to continue doing at a very high level. One is the education of our students, which is multifaceted, as we're trying to explain here this evening, and the other is to have the highest performing research and teaching faculty that we could possibly have. Now, if you asked me what is the, the one big thing that I hoped I could accomplish in the, in the next seven years, it would be to truly deepen and expand the faculty that we have. We, when, when you were in law school, how long ago? So long. <laughs> the memory of man runneth not. <laughs> um, we live in a very complicated world, and the, uh, what I said before is really true. I mean, this law school is international, national, and statewide in its focus, and we have people doing all three of those things all the time, in addition to teaching their classes. And one thing you will find if you're here only two months, as I have been, is that people are here, there, and everywhere. We have a faculty that it is small and it is stretched extremely thin. It is a very talented faculty, but it's as likely as not to find somebody in the Middle East or China or Europe or Africa or South America as it is to find them on the third or fourth floor. And what this means is that we simply don't have enough faculty in the building, in my judgment. we need. It, it, our long-term plan calls for 10 additional faculty. And to do that, and to hire the very best people in the country, I needn't tell you, well, maybe I do need to tell you. Uh, one of the surprises in the last two months has been how competitive the world of law schools is. It's com the schools are competing fiercely with one another, for both for faculty and for students. And it's, um, it's not quite the way it the open warfare that I'm used to in the litigation context, but it's, um, it's very fierce. And um, so when I meet other deans and they say, what can I do to help you? Uh, my response is, 
get your hands off my faculty because there's nobody, no faculty member in this law school isn't constantly a target of opportunity. And so to hire, um, to in, induce people to come to this law school who are terrific people who will expand and extend and enrich what we have here um, is, is, is certainly one of my goals. And to do that, frankly, t will take an enormous financial effort and a, and a big financial push because um, faculties are not cheap. And so uh, it would be easier for me if they were, but uh, they wouldn't be very happy with that and we wouldn't be able to rent retain them. So that's, I think that's the one really big thing. And part of that is because uh, international law has become so important uh, to our students and to our faculty and, you know, frankly, to the, to the business community that to, simply, to try to give coverage in that area uh, is putting a great deal of, of, I won't say strain, it's not really right, but it's a challenge to the law school. It's one we've been able to meet, but it's, it's a challenge. We run two institutes in the summer, one in, in Geneva and one in Hong Kong. We might like to be able to do some additional things in other places in the world. Uh, you, may, you may know that the medical school has created a medical school, a Duke Medical School in Singapore. Uh, Fuqua, which is in uh, danger of taking the parking lot from us, <laughs> is, um, is also essentially everywhere, um, in hotel rooms, in conference centers, all over the world. And I think another question for the law school is how is it going to meet the demands of the international law economy? That's a very big question and it's one that we need to, to think through together. Law firms have become, many have become international. Is that what's going to happen to law schools? Is that what the, the direction that we should go? So I, I see those, those are two very big issues uh, for us to solve. But the, the building and enriching the faculty so that we have more capacity, I think that's very important for our law school. The student body that we have is already wonderful and we're stuck with the alumni so there it is <laughs> but the faculty is i think where we can make some real gains the students we do very very well we are uh, this entering class is uh, by every measure one of the most talented group of students in the in the nation and i've met many of them and they're lovely people on top of that that that's something we can all be proud of and i think you say that the law school has changed a great deal but i think uh, you correct me if i'm wrong but i think there is the sense that the Duke Law School is a community and that it has always been such and that it has had an atmosphere of, um, I would say, of appro an appropriate level of, of competition and collaboration. It's not a cutthroat place. It's a place where the students uh, recognize that they are traveling in space and time with people that are going to be extremely important to them. And it has that um, truly uh, loving atmosphere about it, which I think is one of the reasons I've been so happy here, is that people just are genuinely nice and care about one another. And um, that's a very important quality uh, to have going into the legal profession. So I think that that has been true for some very long period of time, uh, maybe not the entire history of the law school. I, I did look at um, President Nixon's file <laughs> in preparation <laughs> of a talk that I gave a little while ago, and I noticed that one of his recollections was of a faculty member, and I've forgotten his name, but who would stand in front of the students and just yell at them, uh, spittle flying everywhere, on the theory that this was the way to toughen them up for, for appearing before people like me later in life. Uh, I don't think we do too much of that now, but nonetheless, uh, the students are well prepared for both the rigors and the collaborative opportunities in, in law practice. What else? There, you, there are a lot of specific things that I, that I have in mind too, but go ahead. Uh, if, if I may, I'd like to interject a note of humor. <laughs> I think I understood you to say when you first came in that you were delighted to be involved with the law school and with the legal jargon of the, of the school and this type of thing. And I want to tell you about an experience that I had as a first year law student that you might be interested in. I was very privileged to be a member of George Christie's Torch Law class. 
enjoyed the entire class, learned a lot about tort law, was very fond of the professor. It was all a delightful experience. But the best part was the last day of class when all the students came in, and there we had, unbeknownst to us, two or three or maybe four uh, uh, students who had been taking notes all semester. And they had all of this written all over the blackboard, and it was entitled Christieisms. <laughs> <laughs> and it was George Christie's special legal jargon. Oh, no. <laughs> and you might be interested in investigating that if you want to like legal jargon, because it was very, very interesting. <laughs> I'll ask him about it. We had, um, George Christie had his the 40th anniversary of his appointment on September 3rd, and we had a little party for him, and it was absolutely lovely. Three of the professors uh, gave him toasts, uh, Paul Hagen, Paul Carrington, and David Lang, and it was very, it was a lovely and very moving experience, and um, I think he would have enjoyed being there. It was, uh, I know, I know he was very touched by it. So, what other questions? Then I'd like to say something to, oh, go ahead. Tell us about your wife's cattle ranch. <laughs> <laughs> Did she have to give that up when you moved to North Carolina? No, she has not given it up. Um, I am going to the Middle East tomorrow with a group of faculty to, in, in line with what I indicated before, which is a, a potential opportunity for the law school to consider. And she will be traveling to New Mexico, um, also a, a country with, uh, part of the country with <laughs> desert-like conditions, <laughs> and, uh, but less humidity. So I think she comes out ahead. Uh, she, she runs a cattle ranch. Uh, there is a ranch around the ground, obviously, since she can't be there most of the time. And she is selling grass-fed beef, and she would be very happy to sell you half a cow or an entire cow uh, if you'll send her an email. It's at rannyranch.com. It's grass-fed beef. It's supposed to be very good for you. And She's actually sort of part of the food movement in this country, but it's a bit complicated and it would take a long time to explain. But uh, that's really what's going on. Uh, she's still running, running the ranch. And I ran out there in October and did a little branding and a few other things that I won't talk about. <laughs> but don't relate to what a dean does on a daily basis. She needs to meet my father who has a cattle farm in western North Carolina. Although that she would she would love to do that. <laughs> Quite certain. She's been invited to join the um, Orange County Cattlemen's Association, and maybe with her addition, it'll have to be the Cattle Persons Association. <laughs> In any event, she's looking forward to it. I, w I want to say one one thing about leadership uh, before I end. That's a very important topic. I think the clinics are um, important to this. Uh, we think that in the law school that we we train leaders, and lawyers have always been leaders. Leaders in their communities and leaders in the nation, <coughs> statesmen, stateswomen, this is where we find them. And frequently, uh, they begin as leaders in uh, school boards, in county seats, and then they become uh, wonderful leaders on the national scene. And that's a great American tradition which we fully intend to enhance here if we can. We're paying a great deal of attention to it. I've appointed a, a leadership working group. Um, it's not so much that we want to teach people how to manage other people. That's the, <coughs> what happens in the business school, although I don't say that that's unimportant. But we want to be sure that our law students come out of here with all of the skills that they will need uh, to move into positions of leadership in the profession so that they can stand up as these, or sit down in front of a group of people and feel comfortable addressing them. They can stand up in court. Uh, they can go to a meeting, a client meeting. They can articulate. They can persuade. And ultimately, that they believe in something that's important to them, and they pursue it with gusto and efficacy. So we're working on that as well. And I think, ultimately, um, if the school could have the vision that for um, it's faculty, that it will enrich the faculty, that for its students it will train leaders, and that for alumni it will have a continuing educational uh, relationship uh, throughout the time of your life as lawyers. That if that could happen, 
um, and it is happening to a great extent, but if we can make that work just as, as well as we can, then we can all be very proud of something uh, that we will create together because it's, it's, it's not going to happen if we don't work together on this. Thank you all very much for coming and welcoming me here. Make. My name is Melanie Burkett, I'm Assistant Director of Alumni Relations. Um, and in an effort to provide more opportunities like this for local alumni to get together and socialize, um, network, and continue the educational opportunities, we are forming a Duke Law Club of the Triangle. Um, and we have uh, several of our founding members here tonight. If they'll stand when I call my name, Sam Forehand, <laughs> Brian Berman, and Mark Merkin are here. And we are having um, our first meeting next week, next Friday, to try to begin to plan um, a series of alumni events in the area. So if you, any of you would be interested in participating in the organization of that, see me or one of these gentlemen afterwards and we can get you the information on, on when we're meeting and, and what our plans are. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you.